Hello, brothers and sisters. Last week, I was asked to write an article for the National Catholic Register, which is a, probably the most widely distributed national Catholic newspaper in the country, and uh, it's owned by EWTN. And they asked me to do an article on Pope Francis's most recent confusing comments about how he hopes that hell is empty. And so they asked me to write an article about what actually does the church teach about hell being empty. And so I, I wrote an article, we'll link to it here in the, what they call the show notes. So if you just scroll down a little bit and click more, you'll see more information about this program that could be useful to you, including a link to the article. But uh, so what did Pope Francis say? Well, he gave an hour-long television interview to a very popular Italian uh, television program, and this is what he said. What I'm going to say is not a dogma of faith, but my own personal view. I like to think of hell as empty. I hope it is. Now, He's clear that he's only offering that as a personal opinion, a personal hope. Uh, he says it's not dogma. It's not really what the church teaches. But what it does is weaken people's understanding of what actually is dogma. Now, under Pope Francis, dogma has somehow gotten a bad rep. He talks about people who are backward, who hold on to dogma, who hold on to abstract doctrine rather than pastoral compassion. Well, I, I would say that uh, dogma, and what, what is dogma? Dogma is an official declaration of the Catholic Church that God has certainly revealed something to us that's important for our salvation. So uh, dogma isn't just ivory tower speculation. Dogma is the most precious thing we have as a church, the sure understanding of what God's will is for the creation and redemption of the human race, about what we must do to end up in heaven rather than hell. So it's, it's, it's the most important thing we could have. Now, unfortunately, this isn't the first time that Pope Francis has led his sympathies towards an empty hell kind of come out. In a 2018 interview with a very famous atheist uh, intellectual, Pope Francis was reported to having said in the interview that he, uh, there is no hell. Now, there wasn't a transcript. The Vatican says it wasn't an official interview. The Vatican said that what Scalfari, the name of the journalist, reported about the conversation shouldn't be regarded as an exact reproduction of what the Pope actually said, but it didn't come out outright and deny uh, that this thing happened and that uh, Scalfari was a liar. They just didn't say that. Now, this is also a problem because there's a line in Amoris Laetitiae that very famous uh, apostolic exhortation that Pope Francis published after the two synods on the family, which seems to lean in that direction too. He says, no one can be condemned forever because that is not the logic of the gospel. Here I am not only speaking of the divorced and remarried, but of everyone in whatever situation they find themselves. So it seems to be say whatever, whatever objectively sinful situations people find themselves in, they can't be condemned forever for that. It's not the logic of the gospel. Well, I think this is very troubling. You know, it's not clear whether he's talking about the ultimate judgment of condemnation of hell or whether he's talking about the judgment of the he of the church on excommunication or whatever. But even if it's the judgment of the church, 
you know, whatever the church binds on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever the church looses on earth is loosed in heaven. And if somebody's excommunicated for unrepentant, serious sin, and they die in that state, they very well could end up in hell uh, unless they repent. Because what, what, you know, excommunication is only used in very rare cases. And people have many, many opportunities before that penalty is enacted to repent. And they have every opportunity after it's enacted to come back to the Lord, to come back to the faith if, before they die. And if they don't, they very well could end up with a penalty that lasts forever. It's simply not true that the logic of the gospel doesn't condemn anyone forever. Just not true at all. And this is dangerous stuff because what we're dealing with today is a whole atmosphere of what we could call universalism, a whole atmosphere that, well, God's so merciful in the end, everybody will be saved. It's a heresy that's been condemned as a heresy. Uh, some variations of it even say that the devil and all the demons will be finally reconciled in the end, but it's been condemned by church councils. It's just simply not the teaching of the church. It's simply not the teaching of Jesus and the apostles. And one of the things that's absolutely clear is God's not a liar. Jesus is not a bluffer. Jesus is not telling people something that isn't true, but he says when people will be separated forever from God and not enter into the kingdom unless they believe and repent and are baptized, he's telling the truth. So now what has the Catholic Church discerned in divine revelation as being the truth about the four last things? Well, the catechism, basing itself on scripture and tradition, uh, t tells us very clearly what, what the truth is here, what's been revealed to us. So in section 1033 of the Catechism, this is exactly what said, the state of definitive self-exclusion from communion with God and the blessed reserved for those who refuse by their own free choice to believe and be converted from sin, even to the ends of their lives. That's the definition of hell. Section 1035, it says, the teaching of the church affirms the existence of hell and its eternity. Immediately after death, the souls of those who die in a state of mortal sin descend into hell, where they suffer the punishments of hell, eternal fire. The chief punishment of hell is eternal separation from God, in whom alone man can possess the life and happiness for which he was created and for which he longs. The traditional teaching of the church, again, based on scripture, is that there's two pains of hell. One is the pain of eternal separation from God, and the other is bodily pain. We're bodily creatures, souls and bodies, and souls and bodies participate in, in serious sin on this earth, and souls and bodies also participate in the eternal punishment and the pain of eternal punishment, both in our bodies and our souls, just like our bodies participate in the eternal happiness of heaven. In 1979, John Paul II asked Actually. the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith to reaffirm the traditional teaching. And what it says is, in fidelity to the New Testament and tradition, the church believes in the happiness of the just who will one day be with Christ. She believes that there will be eternal punishment for the sinner who will be deprived of the sight of God and that this punishment will have a repercussion on the whole being of the sinner. This is not just an esoteric, abstract teaching. This is not just backward dogma. This is the truth that saves. This is the truth that helps us make wise choices. This is the truth that draws us to repentance and conversion. Now, if I were to describe how the average Catholic looks at the world today, I'd describe it something like this. God is merciful. The church is welcoming and awaits to accompany you and bless and affirm you. The gate is wide and the way easy that leads to eternal happiness, and many are entering by it. The gate that leads to hell is narrow and difficult. And few there are who go by that way. 
Now, you've, you've heard me say stuff like this in the past, and it's just unfortunately the case that so many of our fellow Catholics, so many of our fellow Christians have drifted into a presumption on God's mercy, a foolish understanding of what it means that the church is welcoming. The church is welcoming us to meet Jesus Christ. The church is welcoming us to conversion, to repentance, to faith, to baptism, to the Eucharist. The, the church is welcoming us to a life of discipleship, a life of holiness. As Cardinal Dolan once said, everybody's welcome, but not everything goes. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't emphasize enough how serious this is. This is really a doctrine of demons. You know, the scripture talks about doctrines of demons being infiltrated into the church through plausible liars. You know, we know there's been some really famous theologians that have said things similar to Pope Francis, that have given the impression that maybe nobody goes to hell. And this is just, uh, even though it's a theoretical possibility, it's just not really a good way of describing what's revealed to us. Section 1036 of the Catechism, the affirmations of sacred scripture and the teachings of the church on the subject of hell are a call to the responsibility incumbent upon man to make use of his freedom in view of his eternal destiny. Why is there suffering in the world? It's because of sin. Why does God allow sin? Because without freedom, without the possibility of saying no to God's will, there's no possibility of real love and real friendship. And what the Lord's offering us is something really, really valuable, really, really high. Friendship with God, communion with God, becoming part of the divine family uh, forever. And and there can't be real love or real friendship unless there's freedom. So that means that there's freedom to say no as well as to say yes. And the whole purpose of the church on earth is to encourage people to say yes to God's plan to saving them, which has come to us in Jesus Christ and his teaching. And then it goes on to say, section 36 again, enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. The Catechism is reaffirming sacred scripture here. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, about the broad way and the narrow way. You know, sometimes people say we shouldn't scare people into conversion. We shouldn't tell people about hell because that's an unworthy motive. That's, that's a crock. Jesus told us frequently about how the apostles speak eternally, often about eternal condemnation and destruction, the wrath of God. Uh, and, and it's foolish to deprive people of relevant information about the facts that most determine our eternal destiny. And it's just not in the tradition of the church. You know, St. Francis de Sales, St. Ignatius Loyola, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, many, many, many other saints, Alphonse Liguori, talk clearly about the fear of hell playing a really important role in motivating people to undertake the spiritual journey. Yes, living in fear of hell isn't the dominant thing as we grow in our spiritual life, but it's always a good thing to keep in mind as a protection against delusion, against deception, about giving in to temptation. You know, the ultimate goal of union with God is, is love, of course. And it says, perfect love cast out fear of punishment. Yes, but that's, that's the end of a long stage of spiritual growth. That doesn't click into place just like that. And the fear of hell has an important role to play in motivating us to holiness and also motivating us to evangelization. If you love people, you're going to not just be concerned about them getting healed of their illnesses or getting good jobs or whatever. You're going to be concerned most of all about the thing that's going to affect them forever, which is their eternal destiny. That's why evangelization is so weak, because people don't really believe that anything really rests on it. That maybe it's a good enrichment to somebody's life, but it's more than a good enrichment. It's, it's, it's the difference between an eternity of love with God in heaven and with the communion of saints 
and an eternity in hell with the ugliness and malevolent evilness and horror of the demons. Hey, the people I love, and I love everybody that God puts in my path, I really do. Last night, my wife and myself were getting pizza at a local bar, and, and the only place left to sit, all the tables were sit taken, and it was a half hour wait, so there are two seats at the bar, so we sat at the bar, and there's a man sitting next to us, so we got into a conversation with him, and his wife died a couple of years ago, and he's kind of lonely and very successful guy, retired, but very, very successful, and we got talking, and I asked him if, you know, he asked me what I did, and it's always Interesting. They say, well, I teach theology at Sacred Heart Center in Detroit, and I, the president of Renewal Ministries, a Catholic mission organization, and and then I'll easily ask them, uh, what what do you do? And so he told me what he did. And then I also asked, well, do you have any faith? Did you grow up in, in the church or whatever? And he told me his name was a long Irish name. I won't, won't repeat it, but, you know, three, three first Irish names and the last Irish name. And he said, I went to this grade school, Catholic grade school, and I went to two years of Catholic high school. And I said, well, you know, uh, are, you, are you connected right now? You know, and he said, no, you know, I just— I'm just fed up with religion and churches. And I asked him why. He said, well, all these wars and everything. I said, forget for the moment the question of religion and churches and just focus on the question of God. The Lord created you to be one with him forever. He sent Jesus to be your savior, your Lord, your friend. Just focus on God right now. Other things flow from that. But right now, st start asking God to show himself to you. Start praying. Uh, start meditating on God's word. Uh, ask Jesus to show himself to you. And kind of will go on from there. Well, he said, I'll take this under advisement. But his face was turning red a little bit. And I think it was because something was touching him. Something was appealing to him, and I, I, um, I've been praying for him. I probably won't remember to pray for him much more because every day new prayer requests are coming in, but I believe prayer makes a difference, and we should pray for people when we have encounters like that. But I wouldn't have bothered to talk to him about that if I didn't believe that his eternal destiny was at stake, and I wanted him to end up in heaven rather than hell, and I wanted him to know the Lord for the goodness it brings here in this life, but even for the greater good it brings in eternity. So, now, there's something else I need to say which is going to be controversial, but it's just, you know, I'm not trying to be creative, I'm not trying to be original, I'm not trying to be controversial. I'm just trying to pass on faithfully what God has revealed to us, what the church has affirmed is, is sacred dogma is what God has revealed to us, what the tradition of the church says. One of the things that Cardinal Avery Dulles said, he wrote it in an article on First Things, he said that up until the middle of the 20th century, there were no significant challenges to the traditional two outcome views of the Catholic Church. So for almost 2,000 years, nobody has, has doubted the reality of hell. Nobody's doubted that there's only two final destinations that human beings go to. And the pre prevailing theological cons consensus of sacred scripture was that more were lost than were saved. That is the drift you get when you read sacred scripture. When Jesus tells you what you have to do to enter the kingdom, when the apostles talk about run so as to win the race. Uh, athletes really put a big effort out. You need to put a big effort out too. Nowadays, we're so focused on affirming people in where they are and that God loves you just as you are. And that's a recipe for disaster. You know, and this whole stuff about same-sex blessings and blessing irregular unions, what that does is it just gives a whole impression that, yes, these are less than perfect relationships, but, you know, they're, they're trying the best they can. And they may not be trying as best they can because they're not being told to try. They're not being told that sin is sin. They're not being told that what they're doing is wicked. And that the scripture calls it an abomination. They're not being told that this could exclude them from the kingdom of God. They're not being told to actually do the best they can. You know, what does Jesus say? 
if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your right foot causes you to sin, cut it off. Better to enter the kingdom missing a part of your body than to go into hell with an intact body. Now, this is Jewish hyperbole. But once people hear about Jewish hyperbole, they write it off. Jesus doesn't want us to literally cut off parts of our body to stop sinning. But what he's saying is very serious, very important. He's basically saying, do whatever it takes to get free from serious sin. And what's missing in so much of what's going on today is wishy-washy, ambiguous affirmations and welcomings that don't tell people what they really need to know in order to be saved. There's no urgency and there's no clarity. There's almost a a strategic ambiguity that seems to be wanting to allow loopholes for people to do whatever they want and feel okay about it. This this ties in very much with what Cardinal Fernandez has written about, that you can actually be living in a state of objective sin and be in deep union with the Lord. No. No. There can be diminished culpability. There can be almost no culpability, but what people are doing when they're doing objectively wrong things is damaging them and damaging other people, and they need to be told not that everything might be okay, you may not be fully culpable, they need to be called to repentance, conversion. Oh, yeah. Then Cardinal Dulles goes on and says, as we know from the Gospels, Jesus spoke many times about hell. Throughout his teaching, he holds forth two and only two final possibilities for human existence. The one being everlasting happiness in the presence of God, the other everlasting torment in the absence of God. Cardinal Dulles was considered one of the greatest American theologians in the last, you know, 50 years or so. And he says, taken in their obvious meaning, passages such as these give the impression that there is a hell and that many go there, more, in fact, that are saved. Now, there's a lot more that the Catechism says about the reality of hell and how to avoid it. And the only reason why I'm talking about it, and the only reason I believe why Jesus talked about it, and the only reason why the Catechism is so clear and strong about it, is not because we're obsessed with hell. We're obsessed with salvation. We're obsessed with people not going to hell. We're obsessed with people wanting to be with God forever. We're obsessed with evangelization, with holiness, with the call to repentance and conversion. Ah, you know, I think it's really interesting that the Lord has sent special messengers to us in recent years to warn us about the reality of hell. When Mary appeared at Fatima in 1917, one of the secrets of Fatima, one of the three secrets of Fatima is the reality of hell. And when Mary showed little Jacinta and Francisco and Lucia a vision of hell, it was extremely disturbing to them. And they looked up at Mary saying, help. Mary said, what you've seen is hell where poor sinners go. In order to save poor sinners, Jesus wants to establish devotion to my Immaculate Heart in the world. So what's devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary? It's saying, I want to have a pure heart like Mary had. I want to have a generous heart like Mary had. I want to have an obedient heart like Mary had. I want to have a humble heart like Mary had. I want to say completely and unreservedly yes to the Lord, not just in a one-time conversion experience, but in a daily way. I want to say yes to Jesus like Mary is saying yes to Jesus. Later on, in another apparition of Fatima, Mary said, so many souls are going to hell because so few people are offering prayer and sacrifice for them. Honestly, I think we need to up our intercession for the salvation of souls, particularly in light of this huge deception. It's like a fog, the fog of universalism, the fog of presumption on God's mercy. There's a worse virus in the church today than COVID. It's the virus of universalism. It's the virus of this, maybe hell's empty and whatever. 
That's why it's so serious when Pope Francis says things like this. You know, it's okay for a speculative theologian to speculate, and it's okay for fellow scholars to, you know, engage in scholarly dialogue with them. But when the person who's supposed to be the guardian of the faith, who's supposed to strengthen their brothers and make them stronger in the faith, says things like that to weaken them in their faith, well, it's imprudent. I think it's irresponsible. I think it's also scandalous. And I, Jesus says, you know, anybody who causes the little ones to stumble, it's, it's not going to go well. So I, I just hope that God has a plan. I know he's got a plan for bringing good out of this. I know probably the reason why he's allowing these things to happen, these ambiguous statements, these sympathetic universalist statements. You know, the Pope isn't clearly teaching heresy. He's making clear that this is his personal opinion. This is his personal hope. But that, I believe, does so much damage, weakening people, confusing people, just like happened with the same-sex blessing thing. All the African bishops said, our people are scandalized. Our people can't believe what's being said here. It's a very serious thing to scandalize the little ones, and the little ones are the believers. It's a very serious thing. So I hope that this is something that the Lord has permitted to give us a teaching moment, to give us a chance to say, well, what is the truth? What has God revealed to us about hell? What has God revealed to us about the possibility of going there and what hell is like? I think it's pretty significant that Mary, in one of her central things at Fatima, wanted to reestablish the reality and horror of hell and make very, very clear that many people are going there and we need to do something about it and for the rest of their lives. You know, just sent a particularly, not a day would go by without her offering some sacrifice and some prayer for the salvation of souls. And then St. Faustina, you know, not many years later, you know, 20 something years later, uh, Section 741 of her diary, she talks about how an angel took her on a tour of hell and showed her how horrible it was. And then the Lord told her to write it down. And she wrote it down so that nobody could say that nobody's there. And nobody could say what it's, nobody could say that hell doesn't exist and nobody can deny what it's like. So I think it's pretty significant that the Lord has intervened in St. Faustina and in Mary to remind us of the importance of hell. One of the things that the devil would most like to do, one of the most dangerous deceptions in the church today is the deception we're talking about, which unfortunately Pope Francis has put some fuel in that fire. And quite honestly, if Mary was teaching in a religious education program for seven, nine, and 10 years old and told them about hell, she'd be immediately fired. She, she'd be deemed unworthy of teaching little children. It is so foolish that we are afraid of telling people the truth. Mary felt it was really important that people from a young age know the truth about heaven, about hell, about sin, about prayer, about penance, about what's really going on in the world and what really ultimately matters. So I hope that this little video today and the article I did for National Catholic Register, which will be linked, I, I hope that uh, it's an opportunity for us to get clear about what the cer certain knowledge is that God's revealed to us about these all-important realities. God bless you. You know, I'm really happy in light of the theme of this video and the important truths about our salvation to be able to offer you a special opportunity. This is a booklet, What Must I Do to Be Saved, that my friend and collaborator here at Renewal Ministries, Pete Borak, has written. And it's normally we give it out free uh, to people who respond to our television program. We'll be kind of launching our new season, The Choices We Face in March, and we'll be offering this free to people who watch the video. But we don't want to discriminate against people who watch the YouTube video. And so this would be a tremendous follow-up to this video. What must I do to be saved? Because that's the most important thing that we need to know for ourselves and for those that we love and care about. So if you just go to our website, renewalministries.net, 
click on free booklet. We'll send it out to you. And I think it'll be a tremendous good follow-up to this video. It will really be something you can use to also share and give to people. So God bless you and hope you can get this booklet. Bye.